Well, hello everyone. This is Al Fadi, and you are with us here right now in a special edition of Let Us Reason. And I've already made the announcement a couple of days ago that uh, our dear brother Robert Spencer will be with us, and I'm honored that he is joining us right now. And today's topic, uh, everybody, is going to be a tough one. I mean, not every topic is going to be easy. Um, but uh, for the right reasons why, uh, and, and I think we lost Robert for a second, hopefully he'll be back, uh, for the right reasons as to why we want uh, this topic to be addressed and discussed. And uh, Robert is back with us right now. So uh, all that to say is i like to welcome our dear brother, Robert Spencer. Robert, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for making time for us. I know how busy you are. Thank you. It's a great honor and blessing to be here. I know we've been talking about getting together for so long and something always happens. And so it's uh, wonderful that finally we're able to do it. And uh, I'm sorry about my technical trouble just now. I hit the wrong button, but I'm back now and I'll try to keep my hands off the buttons. Not up problem will be here waiting on you. Don't worry about it. Uh, so uh, before I start, really, I want everybody to know a little thing or two about our dear brother. That's if It's an understatement, actually. I mean, first of all, if, if you guys want to know more about Robert, you can go to jihadwatch.org, jihadwatch.org forward slash about dash Robert. So Robert Spencer is the director of Jihad Watch, and he's also a Shellman fella at the David Horowitz Freedom Center. He's the author, believe it or not, according to the bio, of 19 books. I think he mentioned that it's going to be more than that now. And yeah, it includes basically the New York Times bestsellers, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Islam, uh, another one called The Truth About Muhammad. Uh, he also recently talked about another book concerning the existence of Muhammad with our dear brother, Dr. Jay Smith, which you can go and watch on Jay Smith's channel. And he also had another best-selling book called The History of Jihad from Muhammad to ISIS, which is the subject, by the way, of our live stream right now. And by the way, Robert uh, really trains and teaches seminars on jihad and Islam in general for the FBI, uh, for the Central Command, for the United States Army Command, uh, General Staff College as well, U.S. Armies, and the list can go on and on and on. As we progress during the show today, I'll keep giving you more about his background. With that says, uh, Robert, let's, um, let me ask you this really honest question from my perspective. I know why I'm dealing with Islam and the misery that comes with leaving Islam. What got you, Robert, into such a, a big topic and a, and a really um, not only timely, but dangerous one? You know, we're talking jihad here. Yeah, well, one thing led to another. You know, uh, I my family is from that part of the world. My grandparents were exiled from the Ottoman Empire for declining to convert to Islam and they were given the choice of uh, co conversion or exile. So they left, they went to New York City, and uh, the rest is history. Uh, I was born in the United States, of course, and uh, when I was very young, I would ask them about life over there, and they would tell me about it <coughs> in uniformly positive terms, tell me about how wonderful it was. And then I would ask the inevitable question, well, then why did you leave? And then they would not, either could not or would not explain it to me, probably would not. And that made me all the more interested. So I started to read and study about the history of that time and that region and found the more I went into it, the more it pointed uh, entirely back to Islam. It was all about Islam from start to finish, why they had to leave, why they were exiled. And uh, I started to study Islam as a result, to try to understand all this. Then uh, <clears throat> I was consulting in the 1990s with uh, some individuals and groups about Islamic issues on a private basis. And then after 9-11, one of them asked me to write a book because I kept telling him how the news coverage of 9-11 was all wrong in terms of their explanations of why it happened and that it was completely false what they were telling the American people. And so he said, well, you write it then, you set it out there. And I said, well, I'm, I'm, 
I'm nobody. What's anybody going to care what I think about it? And he said, well, that's true, but stick to what the Islamic texts say and just uh, outline them. And that's what I've done in all my books, actually, uh, is quote very copiously from the Islamic texts. So it's kind of ironic, really, when people say, oh, this is hateful material and so on, because then what they're really saying is the Quran and the Sunnah are hateful because that's that's right. all I'm doing is quoting them. It's, it's rather interesting, Robert, isn't it, that the minute you quote the primary sources, we're not talking secondary, primary sources of Islam, all of a sudden you're called Islamophobe. Yeah, well, you know, that's just a tactic. It's uh, something I've noticed for many years that uh, there are Muslim clerics, imams and muftis and various clerics all over the world of all the different sects and all the different madhadhid, the schools of jurisprudence, and they all say, uh, I mean, they, all, they don't all say anything, but I mean, from time to time, you see videos, I see videos of them saying, we have to wage jihad against the unbelievers. Uh, I just uh, actually put up a video for tomorrow, scheduled it for tomorrow at uh, my website, Jihad Watch, of a Muslim cleric invoking the Quran, uh, kill them wherever you find them, from chapter 2, verse 191 and 489, along with uh, also in 9.5, where it says, kill the idolaters, wherever the mushrikun, wherever you find them. That uh, whenever they, and quoting this to say that uh, Palestinians should kill Israelis, and they're Muslim clerics who say this kind of thing all the time, that they quote the Quran, they invoke Muhammad to say that we must kill and subjugate infidels. And then I say, so-and-so Muslim cleric says, Muslims should kill infidels. And then the Organization of Islamic Cooperation or the New York Times or some uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center or something like that, they say, see, Spencer's Islamophobic. He says that uh, Muslims should kill infidels. Well, I was just quoting the guy who says it. And the unremarked problem here about so-called Islamophobia is that there are Muslim clerics who do say these things all over the world all the time. And it's not being addressed. It's being deflected by blaming those like me who are just report on these facts. Absolutely, Robert, and I like what you mentioned. And, and here's an interesting thing. Next week, I'm gonna have a gentleman, uh, his, his identity will remain uh, at least uh, protected uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, we're gonna be talking about the psychology of jihad. And the funny part is he was quoting from an imam who has a YouTube channel using clips from him. They shut down his channel and they said, oh, that's an Islamophobe, he's like, I'm quoting another YouTube channel. And they appealed it, and good for him. They opened it back. It's just ridiculous sometimes, those kind of things. And they've done this for years. I've seen this for many, many years now. Uh, you may recall uh, Hirt Wilders and his film Fitna. And this Fitna is a short film that quotes the Quran and then shows Muslim clerics exhorting people to do acts of violence on the basis of those verses and then shows acts of violence that actually resulted. And so it's very, it's a very clear trajectory and it's all based on what the Quran says and on how Muslim clerics interpret what the Quran says. It shows them saying the Quran says this, so we must go out and do violence against the Kufar. And his film was roundly denounced as Islamophobic and hateful without anyone seeming to pick up on the iron. And this is what, 15 years ago now? Something right. like that. Nobody picked up on the irony that it's just quoting the Quran. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think what's happening now, Robert, and I could be wrong, um, that social media now and uh, these platforms are really, uh, you know, refuting all of these ridiculous arguments. I mean, you can really be closed minded if you want. That's up to you. But the info is out in the open. Anyone and everyone can go and find it now. Yeah. And so powerful forces in the Islamic world, I'm sure that the Saudis uh, and others are uh, making sure, I'm sure with numerous financial incentives, that uh, YouTube and the others shut down material that's critical of Islam. And uh, I think we're going to see a lot more of that happening in the near future. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention what happened with uh, David Wood just a couple of days ago. He was talking about the persecution of Christians, for God's sake. I mean, uh, it's documented, actually. He was repeating facts that are mentioned in reports. And 
look what happened. Uh, he received a strike just for this, uh, which is absolutely uh, mind boggling to me. And uh, that's why I'm so glad the president at least did this executive order. I'm not so sure really uh, the weight that this order will have on such platforms, of course. Yeah, uh, clearly Twitter is defying it already. Uh, they uh, put a restriction on one of his tweets after the executive order came out. And so clearly Twitter has appointed itself the arbiter of thing what can be said and what cannot be said in the United States today. And this is going to be a showdown as to whether the freedom of speech and free society will be preserved or whether we will get all our uh, information filtered through these self-appointed guardians of what is acceptable and what is not. That is uh, awesome. Again, uh, uh, folks, if you're tuning in, this is Let Us Reason Special Edition. With me here, our dear uh, friend and uh, brother Robert Spencer, uh, who's the director of Jihad Watch. If you don't know anything about Jihad Watch, I encourage you to go and uh, Google jihadwatch.org. You'll find amazing information. And and uh, to my knowledge, Robert, uh, this information gets updated almost on a daily basis sometimes. Oh, absolutely on a daily basis. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. I uh, I haven't had a day. Well, I was ill last year, but otherwise I, ha I haven't had a proper day off in about 15 years. Uh, it's a daily thing. And uh, there are at least 10 posts every day of news and commentary on jihad activity in the United States and around the world. The only place where you're going to find a lot of this information. Absolutely. And really, it's my dream that uh, we have you back again in the future to talk about Sharia also and its influence in the West. Uh, that's a whole different topic. So, so my friend, walk us through this book, uh, basically, that we uh, are interested in showcasing here. I know it's been published. I'm not saying this is something new right now, but I want people, uh, there's a lot of people that don't know about uh, half of the stuff that is out there right now. So the book itself is called Jihad, right? The History of Jihad from Muhammad to ISIS. That's right. Uh, the history of jihad. I like the title. It's the history of jihad, first of all, and you're given a time frame from Muhammad to ISIS. When was ISIS? It's still going on. You know, we're dealing with ISIS right now. So basically, you're saying it's going to keep on going. Yeah. And this is a history of jihad from the beginning, from Muhammad, at least as he is depicted in the Islamic traditions up to now. And I wrote it because there isn't another book like this. If you look around, there is no history of jihad that covers the whole history in a single volume. It simply does not exist. And, you know, uh, there was a great writer years ago who said that all the books that he wrote were books that he wanted to read that did not exist. And so <laughs> he had to write them himself. And this was uh, a primary example of that. There is a book called Jihad by Paul Fergosi came out around the year 2000 or 2001. And it's an excellent book, but it only covers the jihad against Europe. The history of jihad is the only book that covers the jihad against Europe, as well as the jihad against India, the jihad in Africa, the jihad in America, everywhere. And it's Absolutely. the first and only comprehensive history of this 1400 year phenomenon. And I, and I like the fact that you started it from the main source. That's Muhammad. I mean, Muhammad is the one who is the, uh, the founder of Islam. Muhammad is the one that supposedly revealed the Quran. Muhammad is the one that the Hadith is attributed to him. Muhammad was the model for his followers. And I'm not aware of any commands where Muhammad says, you know, you can use this only if, you know, it's open-ended commands most of the time, you know, if not even all of the time. One would even argue during the first 13 years of Muhammad's ministry in Mecca, even the so-called peaceful messages had a hidden and embedded messages in them about a warning that if you don't do this, something is coming your way. Yeah, there's no doubt. There's a great deal that's said about the tolerant Meccan verses, but I've always thought that was a bit overstated. The, the Meccan verses are full of threats, of warnings of hellfire, and as you note, intimations, hints that uh, the punishment will not just be in the next world, but in this one as well. And in the Medinan verses, of course, that's made explicit. And not only is it made explicit, but I think one of the most telling, well, I'll give you two of the most telling passages of the entire Quran that are completely unknown and overlooked uh, by the Western intelligentsia to the detriment of everybody who lives in Europe and North America. And that is the uh, First, chapter 8, verse 39, uh, fight them until religion is all for Allah. 
And many, many Islamic apologists, as you well know, in the United States say, uh, fight them until uh, so they say that jihad is only defensive, that you can only fight if you're attacked and that uh, fighting a defensive war, there's nothing wrong with that. And everybody does that. So how can anybody fault Muslims for defending themselves? But fight until religion is all for Allah is not defensive war. There is no way it can be interpreted as defensive war. It is clearly about uh, an offensive war in order to establish Islamic hegemony. There is no other way that a Muslim could fulfill the command to fight until religion is all for Allah unless he picks fights and starts exactly. battles with non-Muslims whose religion is not for Allah. And so uh, that's one. The other one is chapter 9, verses 14 and 15, which says, fight them and Allah will punish them by your hands. And of course, we know that in the New Testament, the scriptures say, the vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. But this is just the opposite of that. And saying, you are the executors of the wrath of God, uh, of Allah, you are the ones who will punish people on behalf of Allah. And so fighting against unbelievers becomes a divine responsibility, an es eschatological duty that they have to fulfill in order right. to please Allah. And if they do not do that, then Allah's wrath is not poured out upon the unbeliever, and that creates an order in which Allah is not the supreme God. And so it's tantamount to blasphemy to not wage jihad against unbelievers. It has to be done. And in doing it, it's a holy act because the Muslims are living out the, are, are enacting the punishment that has been pronounced by Allah on the unbelievers. Absolutely. And um, it just baffles me how even uh, intelligent Muslims, you know, can uh, look the other way uh, at commands as such. Now, I understand not every Muslim have access to the Arabic. Not every Muslim can understand the Arabic. I get it. I understand. I also would argue not every Muslim is on board with the idea of violence. I get it. But these Muslims don't have the say so. The final say is in the primary sources. The final say is to the God of Islam and the Prophet of Islam. Even the Quran says he, both of them have the final say so over anything. So you cannot, even as an open minded Muslim, 21st century Muslim, the Zodi Jasser type of Muslim, to try to even convince the other Muslim community to follow along by declining some of these passages. So, uh, yeah. you know, with that in mind, you know, Robert, I brought Zodi Jasser into the equation. I've, I've talked to uh, him via, uh, you know, Fox News before doing topics. You've debated with him as well. My question is, is it possible really for the so-called Ref Reformation movement or moderate Muslims to topple such teachings? Well, uh, the, it's an extraordinarily uphill battle that they face. As you noted, the Quran, chapter 33, verse 36, it says, it is not for the believer to, uh, how does it go? I don't have it in front of me, but it's not for the believer to rethink or dissent from or judge again something that has been decided by Allah and his messenger. And the matter has been decided. Yes, exactly. And in Islamic tradition, all the doctrines about jihad have been decided by consensus, ijma. This, they are not open to reinterpretation or reevaluation because it has been declared by the Islamic scholars of all the major Islamic sects and schools of jurisprudence that they have been decided. And consequently, they cannot be revisited. Uh, it's a distinction, though, that many people lose because they, they, they've never thought about it for a second, of course. But they, there's a tremendous confusion among people because they don't distinguish between Islam and Muslims. And there might be Muslims who are very nice guys, who are very friendly, who are very gentle, but that does not change the teachings of Islam. And many, many people fall into uh, what Dr. Andrew Boston calls the my friend Ahmed syndrome, as in my friend Ahmed at work, you know, he's the sweetest guy. He wouldn't hurt a fly. He's, he's a beautiful guy. And uh, uh, how can you say that Islam is warlike or teaches warfare when my friend Ahmed is such a nice guy? Well, your friend Ahmed may be better than his religion. And that is possible because the religion teaches warfare against and subjugation of unbelievers. And so if an individual Muslim does not adhere to that, that's great. 
but it does not change the teachings of the Quran or of Muhammad. Yeah, and, and there's a reason why people like Zudi Jasser's life is in danger. I mean, he's, he's, he's a Muslim. He never recanted Islam. He did not leave Islam. He never said he's an apostate. He just trying to reinterpret, actually, uh, the teaching of the Quran and, and some of these doctrines, and yet his life is in danger. Chapter 5, verse 3 of the Quran. This day I have perfected your religion for you. If the religion is perfect, what are you going to reform or, or, or recreate? It's perfect already. You, you change it, you're only going to make it worse. And so right. there's never been the only as I show in the history of jihad, there are never there's never been there have never been reform movements within Islam that rejected the violent teachings or taught peaceful coexistence with unbelievers uh, as equals. There has never been such. The only kind of reform there have been reform movements throughout the history of Islam as I show in the book also, not just the Wahhabis, although the Wahhabis are the best known reform movement nowadays, but going back in Islamic history, the Almohads, the Almoravids, many, many of these groups started out the Mahdi revolt in Sudan in the 19th century. Many of these movements started out as Islamic reform. But what does reform mean? The Protestant reformers in Christianity said they were taking the religion back to the original Teaching, Sources. exactly. Clearing away things that had crept in and going back to the roots. So if you go back to the roots in Islam, if you're a reformer in Islam and you're going to clear away everything that comes later and go back to the roots, you're going to get violence against unbelievers because that is at the root of Islam. And so all the reform movements have been even more virulent and violent than that which they were reforming, than what came before. Over time, because human beings are everywhere the same, human nature is everywhere the same, people got tired of fighting war all the time. People got tired of living in this state of tension and on the edge and with this terror all the time. And so the Islamic rules, Sharia was relaxed in many, many areas, many times throughout Islamic history. But then when something went wrong, some uh, setback, some military defeat, economic depression, any kind of setback for the society. And uh, the Islamic pre pre preachers would say, this is because we've rejected Islam. We have to get back to Islam. And that's when the reform movements would begin and the violent teachings would be reasserted. So when we talk about reform in Islam today, as if it's going to be peaceful, well, uh, maybe I can't say it's, anything is never going to happen because history is full of surprises but it faces extraordinary obstacles and is without precedent in Islamic history. Absolutely, absolutely. And I wanna uh, you know, add to what you just said, but before I do that, uh, thank you again for everyone for uh, tuning in and watching uh, Let Us Reason Special Edition. With us here, our friend Robert Spencer, who is the director of Jihad Watch. And by the way, uh, Spencer uh, has appeared on BBC, ABC, CNN, Fox News, and the list can go on and on and on. He's also a weekly columnist for PJ Media and Front Page Magazine. That's something for those of you who are interested, of course, to uh, uh, follow uh, some of his writing. It's, it's amazing. His site, Jihad Watch, of course, is one of the most amazing, up-to-date sites that tell you a lot about, basically, uh, what's going on in the world of uh, Islam and specifically under the acts of violence and jihad and terrorism. Your site, by the way, along with the religion of peace are, are at the top of the list of uh, places that I like to go to uh, to get these kind of updates. Now, uh, here is a funny part. I'm going to show you a comment that goes along with uh, my friend Ahmed comment that you made. And then I'll ask you a question. Here's one of our uh, friends here, uh, uh, Sophia Gabi. She said, my friend Ahmed, real person, changed in a heartbeat when I said the wrong thing. He was no longer nice. Um, and, and that really speaks volumes. You know, you can have a nice friend, I tell people, but talk negative about Muhammad and see what happens. Yeah, you know, actually that happened to me way back. My goodness, uh, 1980, before probably most of the people watching this were born. But I was in college, and uh, I had Muslim friends who were trying very hard to convert me to Islam. And I used to have lunch regularly with this one fellow, Mahmoud. And uh, he was a very nice guy, very, very friendly fellow. But one day we started to discuss Muhammad, 
And it became clear that not only did I not accept that he was a prophet and would not accept that he was a prophet, but I didn't even think that he was a very exemplary human being. And he got very icy and we didn't have any more lunches after that. He was very unfriendly. And I'm lucky that he was only unfriendly, of course, knowing what I know now, which I did not know then, it could have been considerably more dangerous situation. Yeah, thank you, brother. And and I wanna just uh, uh, advise our moderators to pay attention to uh, our friend Fatima. Uh, so with that in mind, I like the title that you mentioned also from Muhammad to ISIS. First of all, what does it mean that we're talking about ISIS? Let me put it another way. Are we saying terrorism and jihad and its doctrine ended when we officially end ISIS, that's if we're successful in ending that? No, certainly not. Uh, the title only refers to the fact that ISIS is a contemporary jihad movement. And so when we're speaking about the history of jihad, I wanted to illustrate that I was going to be tracing it from the beginning to today. Uh, it may be if I am blessed to live another few years that I could do a revised edition of this book that would uh, change the title based on whatever the newer jihad group is, but there will be another. And it's also worthwhile to note in connection with the, the previous topic we were discussing, brother, is that uh, ISIS is also a reform movement, or you could say a revival movement. It is designed to implement Islam as it is taught by the Quran, and exemplified in the life of Muhammad and in the teachings of the Sunnah. And so everything that ISIS did when it had its caliphate in Iraq and Syria is all in the Quran and all in the teachings of Muhammad, every last bit of it. And so if you're looking for Islamic reform in this classic sense of reform, as the word also has its meaning in Christianity of Getting, endeavoring to get back to the basics, get back to the true teachings, get back to the roots, then ISIS is reform Islam. And so it's, uh, it's, it's not a good sign for the prospects of a peaceful reform. I should also mention before we leave uh, the topic of reform altogether, the Islamic concept of bida or innovation. Bida, exactly. Is, uh, very, very, very serious sin. It's a, it's a terrible thing to do. And it's innovation. It's making something new. You can't make something new. You have to go by what is old. Exactly. Going by what is old, you're not reforming it. You are only just filling in the blanks as they have been filled in for 1,400 years, and that means violent jihad. And, and that's what ISIS uh, uh, always did. They claimed their followers of the prophetic way. And they're Salafis, of course. I mean, I grew up uh, as a Salafi myself, meaning live in 7th century Islam. That's what Salafi mean. It doesn't matter what century you're in. If you truly want to adhere to the prophetic way, the way of the prophet and his companions and their Salaf, basically, you have to live according to the 7th century. And, um, you know, ISIS was very stern, even against Muslims, by the way. I mean, I tell people, they, they tell me, oh, all of these Christians that were forced to migrate from Syria. I'm like, no, I don't think so. There's a lot of Muslims that were forced to migrate from uh, from Syria. Why? Because they were not following the way of Islam. According to ISIS, they're no Muslim at all. Because ISIS was true Islam, the reform Islam, that was the embodiment of the true thing as far as they were concerned. So the other people were apostates and heretics. Oh, one other thing about Islamic reform that you... you, you uh, you recall to mind in this is uh, Mahmoud Mohammed Taha from Sudan, who in 1985 taught that the uh, relatively peaceful, we've already noted that they really aren't as peaceful as they're reputed to be, but the relatively peaceful Meccan verses should supersede the more violent Medinan verses and consequently Islam could reform in, this, in the direction of being peaceful by making the Meccan verses take precedence over the Medinan. And he was hanged by the Sudanese government as a heretic because there's a death penalty for heresy. That is also going to inhibit any genuine or any Islamic reform in the sense of being becoming more peaceful. Absolutely. So walk us through the book. Um, the idea behind it, what, what prompted you to write about it? Obviously, it was written during the time of ISIS, we can tell. But what prompted you really uh, to talk about it and take it all the way back to the time of Muhammad? Why didn't you focus on ISIS only? Again, I mean, I know the things, but I want my audience to be aware of that. 
Well, I did actually write a book uh, called The Complete Infidel's Guide to ISIS, uh, three years oh, before. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so I did write a book totally about ISIS and also the, the Truth About Muhammad, a biography of Muhammad based on the earliest Islamic sources. So uh, in terms of Muhammad and ISIS, I covered those bases, but I saw that there was a need in the sense that even most people who, most Christians who speak to Muslims, Christian apologists who debate with Muslims, even very knowledgeable ones, they are not aware of anything that happened between Muhammad and say 9-11, except for the big things like say the conquest of Constantinople, which happened on this day, May 29th in 1453, the, uh, of course the 9-11 attacks, maybe a few other historical events, the Crusades and so on. But for the most part, I think in the West, even among people who are knowledgeable about these issues, there was a tremendous amount of ignorance regarding what happened after Muhammad and all the way up to when the modern jihad terror movements like Al Qaeda and ISIS were formed. And so I wanted to fill in that gap and to show people because I often heard uh, people assume, people would say to me when I was giving speeches various places around the country or even in, outside the country, people would say, well, you're talking about the extremists. I would get this over and over. And I, would, I realized after a while that they had this idea in their minds that the vast, and this is of course comes from the media and comes from the mainstream Islamic scholars, that uh, the vast majority of Muslims are not only peaceful, which of course is largely true because they simply don't wish to wage jihad or it's not the time for them to wage jihad or any number of other considerations, or they're simply not very religious or whatever. But not only are they, not peace, are not, are they peaceful, but the assumption is that they reject the understanding of jihad that ISIS embodies and that Al Qaeda embodies. And so I wanted to show that actually the understanding of jihad that ISIS and Al Qaeda hold is something that is very old, that goes back to the beginning of Islam, and that in every period in the history of the world, since the beginnings of Islam to now, there have been Muslims who have behaved in accord with those teachings. And this is not generally known. And people assume that there was wonderful periods. Oh, that's another thing that people actually think of, brother, when they do think of what they know about Islamic history. They think they know that Muslim Spain was <clears throat> this wonderful oh, paradise of tolerance and uh, that the Ottoman Empire was another beautiful, tolerant society. And so I show in the book in great detail from contemporary Islamic historians that the that Muslim Spain and the Ottoman Empire and every other Islamic entity, particularly in India, were were actually brutal and bloody and repressive to their non-Muslim subjects. And that this was not a bug, it was a feature. In other words, this was not just because they were repressive tyrants who were hijacking Islam. This was because they were carrying out the teachings of Islam. And so now it's all out there on record for anybody who wants to see in one easily accessible book that uh, I hope is readable and interesting, that you can see that there's an unbroken chain of jihad activity from the seventh century to today, and that it is all based on the theology that was elaborated around Muhammad's actions and is in the Quran that will make for Muslims waging war against non-Muslims as long as there are Muslims and non-Muslims. Absolutely. And again, uh, for those of you who just joined in, this is Let Us Reason Special Edition. With us here, our dear brother Robert Spencer. We're talking about his book, The History of Jihad from Muhammad to ISIS. And the book, by the way, is available uh, in, uh, in different sites and also in a couple of formats at least. So uh, I would encourage those of you who do not have uh, access to a book like this, to get this particular one, because I very much doubt you'll find a single source or a single book that can talk about all of the aspects that are being shared there. Now, uh, Robert, uh, the first chapter you called it, I bring you slaughter, uh, the battles of Muhammad. It's an interesting phrase, and, and I know uh, the history behind it, but why did you choose that particular phrase as your opening <laughs> you know, chapter? Well, you know, you have jihad that means struggle. And there are all kinds of jihads in Arabic, just as there are all kinds of struggles in English. So you can struggle to quit smoking or lose weight, 
And you can also have the civilizational struggle against communism. And it's the same word, even though the, the first two are small things for an individual and the other is a huge matter involving nations. And it's the same thing in, in, in uh, Arabic. The Islamic Republic of Iran, which of course is not an Arabic country, but is heavily influenced, is an Islamic country and is heavily influenced by Islamic Arabic and Islamic concepts. They have a department in the government, the Department of Agricultural Jihad, which has nothing to do with blowing things up on farms. It has to do with trying to increase crop yields, struggling on the farm to make the farm more efficient. And it's jihad because it's a struggle, but it has nothing to do with terrorism, nothing to do with violence. And yet, of course, as you and I both know, the primary meaning of jihad in Islamic theology is warfare against unbelievers and their subjugation under the rule of Islamic law. Now, many, many people are confused about this. Obviously, they're lied to about this. There is misinformation and disinformation out there. Islamic apologists will tell you that uh, they will quote this, this weak hadith, a, a hadith that has no basis in the hadith collections that Muslims consider most reliable, where Muhammad says, after a battle, we are now going from the lesser jihad to the greater jihad, which uh, is supposed to mean that uh, the greater jihad is the struggle within the soul to please Allah, and the lesser jihad is the uh, warfare. That contrary to that, jihad has been has meant warfare primarily throughout Islamic history and in the time of Muhammad himself. So I emphasize that by taking a statement from the life of Muhammad of Ibn Ishaq, where he goes to the Quraysh, the tribe from which he was uh, he was from, the tribe he was born into, and that initially rejected his claim to be a prophet. And he said, Quraysh, I bring you slaughter. And I highlighted that as the title for the first chapter to show that a spiritual struggle was not primarily what Muhammad had in mind. That's what right. Muhammad had in mind for jihad was warfare. And he fought battles himself. He exhorted his followers to fight battles. And he told them that those who fought battles would be better off and rewarded more by Allah than those who did not. Absolutely. And I agree with you that even... Uh, in those so-called Meccan passages that many will point to and say, well, look, they were peaceful. I actually wrote an article myself on Answering Islam where I would argue even those Meccan passages have threats of violence embedded in him. And, you know, Muhammad was a political leader and a military leader. He knew that it's not the right time for me to wage war until I have enough alliances and enough troops to be able to wage that battle. And that's exactly what happened. It, it's no miracle that when he moved to Medina, he already have thousands of Arabs and tribes already uh, uh, making a covenant with him. So that's why he found himself from few to many that will be willing to wage. And it's no wonder then w uh, war started immediately after that. So in, in the second chapter, it seemed like you are focusing on uh, basically the age of the great conquest, you said. And then you move on to chapter three and you talk about the jihad comes to Spain and India. And then after that, consolidation and oppression. It seemed like you're moving in a progressive way here. Could you shed some light on that? Yeah, the book is roughly chronological. Uh, I actually wrote it chronologically for the most part as well. and. Uh, it does have to go back, switching scenes back and forth a bit, because in the uh, eighth and ninth centuries in particular, but also thereafter to a tremendous degree, up until uh, the fall of the uh, of the uh, Byzantine Empire, really, there are two great theater and the Mughal Empire. There are two great theaters of jihad warfare, and that is Europe, but also India. And so it has to go back and forth between the two, but otherwise. It's roughly chronological. Each chapter uh, covers a couple of centuries of jihad activity and shows how these same teachings that we find in the in the age of Muhammad and in the uh, as as it's uh, told in the Islamic traditions anyway, and in the age of the rightly guided caliphs, so-called the four immediate successors of Muhammad, uh, that they fought he fought battles, they fought battles. And then the later Muslims took those battles out. Well, actually, the rightly guided caliphs began to conquer this huge expanse of territory, such that by 100 years after Muhammad is supposed to have died, the Muslims control a territory that is stretching from Spain to India. And so 
In the book, I, whenever possible, quote, Islamic historians, not Islamic historians of the present day or apologists, but court historians of the time in which the events happened. All of the uh, uh, kings and emperors and rulers, caliphs included of those days, they had court historians. Court historians were just what the words mean. They were in the court of the king and <clears throat> they would write down what happened, praising his exploits. So it's noteworthy that many of the Muslim court historians who I quote throughout the book, they uh, write about bloody conquests, bloody battles, massacres of huge numbers of non-Muslims, particularly in India, and they're happy about it. They write about it as if it is a manifestation of the great virtue of the ruler. And this is because in an Islamic understanding, it is. This was way before they... Uh, developed the tremendous deceptive enterprise of saying Islam is a religion of peace and try, began trying to lure, uh, lull Westerners into complacency. They knew that Islam was warlike and violent. They were proud of it. They thought that it was ordained by Allah. And so I show all the way through the book in the words of the Islamic historians themselves that they, they uh, saw acts of violence committed in the name of Islam and in accord with its teachings, they liked those acts of violence, they were happy about them, and they recorded them with great joy as if they were bringing glory upon the rulers whose, whose uh, exploits they were chronicling. Amen. 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 Again, thank, Again you. thank you, everyone, thank you. for joining us. And uh, let us read in special edition. Uh, the topic is the history of jihad from Muhammad to ISIS. And it's named after a book that our uh, guest here, our brother Robert Spencer, wrote. And he is definitely, in my view, an expert on the topic of jihad terrorism and Sharia as well. And I have a lot of respect for people like Robert because they stick their neck out there and they really got nothing to gain out of that. But because they believe in the cause and the truth and they want everyone to be educated, might I add, Muslims will benefit from books like this because many of them don't have a clue what the primary sources teaches. Sometimes they don't even have access to it. Sometimes they don't even need to have to, to read it in Arabic. So I recommend it even for Muslims who want to just know what their primary sources is because Robert quotes from the primary sources in his book. He wasn't trying to come up with his own conclusions. He was quoting things that are documented in Islamic sources. So if you have an issue as a Muslim with these uh, quotations and the sources, then you have an issue with your sources, basically. That's all you are doing. Well, uh, Robert, looking at uh, you know the book, uh, you moved on to talk about also that the victims of jihad strike back and then the jihad advances into Europe. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about these two di dichotomies? Yeah, uh, the victims of Jihad Strike Back is, if I recall correctly, let me make sure here before I say something inaccurate. Yeah, that's the Crusades. And a lot of people have a tremendous misunderstanding about the Crusades. So I devoted a whole chapter of the book to them and their aftermath because uh, the people think that the Crusades were the beginning of hostility between the West and the Islamic world. As a matter of fact, right after 9-11, former President Bill Clinton actually said that the 9-11 uh, had its roots in the Crusades and that that was the beginning of mistrust between the West and the Islamic world. And he understood this as being a gratuitous attack by Westerners, by the Europeans, against the peaceful Muslims who had been minding their own business. And so in the first place, in the opening chapters of the book, I show that the Muslims had not been peaceful and had not been minding their own business. They first besieged Constantinople, which was the capital of the great Christian empire, the Byzantine empire or the Eastern Roman empire. Uh, they, they first besieged it in 675 and then again in the year 711 and then again later in the eighth century and on and on for 700 years, they tried to conquer Constantinople until they were finally victorious, as I said, on this day, May 29th in 1453. Uh, they made tremendous inroads into Europe, even without conquering Constantinople, conquering Spain, of course, move entering into France, conquering actually uh, over half of France uh, before they were driven back by Charles Martel. And all that is in the book. 
uh, conquering North Africa, which had been Christian. People don't know this, that Morocco, right. Algeria, Tunisia, uh, Libya, Egypt, they were all Christian lands. And uh, the Muslim armies in the seventh century and the eighth century swept over those Christian lands, conquered them, and uh, subjugated the Christians such that most of them left the area or became Muslim. Uh, they conquered <clears throat> all these other areas and nothing was done except attempts to defend themselves by the Christians until the Crusades. And it was in the year 1095 that Pope Urban II called upon Christians in Europe to venture to the Middle East to defend Christian pilgrims who were visiting the, the, the sacred sites of the Holy Land, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and so on, which had been leveled by the Caliph Abu, uh, Abu Hakim, I believe it was. And uh, in any case, the Crusades, in other words, were an attempt to defend pilgrims who wanted to go to the Holy Land and to create a small Christian enclave in the Middle East so that the pilgrims would be safe and the Christian sites protected because uh, uh, Abdul Hakim had also destroyed thousands of churches. So, and that was in the beginning of the 11th century. So this is the end of the 11th century. Pope Urban II is calling the crusade. It was not a gratuitous imperialist action. It was not an unprovoked attack. It was a response to 450 years of jihad violence that had destroyed over half of Christendom. I should add also that uh, not only Egypt and the rest of North Africa and Spain and France were Christian and then were conquered, although Spain and France were uh, reconquered and not all of France was conquered in the first place, but also Syria and the whole Middle East was Christian and uh, that also was conquered and Islamized. And the Crusades were an attempt to fight back, finally, after 450 years. And just to recapture a small part, not even very much, of what had been conquered by the Islamic army. So that's why that chapter is uh, called The Victims of Jihad Strike Back. It's about uh, how people who have had their nations overwhelmed and menaced, threatened, or conquered outright by the warriors of jihad, they finally start to... Uh, take the battle back to the Muslims. And because the, uh, the, the Islamic spokesmen today are so very skillful at public relations, and they know that most Americans don't know their history, they say that it was a terrible thing that the Crusaders attacked the Muslims, and they've gotten even Christians ashamed of their history and their heritage in this regard. The Crusaders did some things that were wrong and, and cannot be endorsed. There's no doubt about that. But at the same time, the enterprise itself was a noble one. And the attempt to uh, defend pilgrims and defend the Holy Land, there's nothing wrong with that. And yet we see uh, Christian schools and colleges renaming their sports teams that were called Crusaders because they're ashamed of their own history. So I hope that this book will be seen by some of those people and they will rethink their stance. They have nothing to be ashamed of. And the more that they are ashamed of their history, the more it's going to repeat itself. The same jihadis will come upon them and they will uh, not be prepared to defend themselves because they will be overwhelmed by guilt and shame for how they defended themselves in the past, even though there's no reason for them to be ashamed. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Again, again, again uh, thank, thank you for everyone, everyone for, uh, uh, joining us and watching. Watch. Uh, uh, the yeah, special yeah. edition of Let Us Reason with us here is our dear brother, Robert Spencer. And we have, by the way, for the benefit of everybody, about 10 more minutes. Uh, and then Robert, uh, I told him that it will be an hour for him. I'm going to stay online, folks. I'm going to deal with any uh, outstanding issues related to this. I have an article that I wrote on the topic that I want to discuss with you. But I want to give our brother the benefit of just uh, downloading everything and going to uh, rest after this. And of course, we thank all of you. We thank the moderators. We thank those who uh, have been given through the super chat. And uh, I want to point to you that uh, we will have a special guest again. Uh, who will be joining us, Mike Westerfield, who will be talking about the psychology of Islam, the psychology of Islam this Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, you know, looking at your book, uh, looking at the chapters, the chronology that you're following, we get now into Islam 
making its way into Europe, the Ottoman Empire. And I just want people to understand from your perspective and your research about the importance of the concept of caliphate in general as it ties to this. Well, the, the, the caliph is the successor of Muhammad as the political, military, and spiritual leader of the Muslims. So uh, that's very important. The successor of Muhammad obviously is uh, clearly somebody who will be supreme in commanding the allegiance of Muslims. And this is one of the reasons why jihad terror groups like ISIS are so intent on reestablishing the caliphate, which was abolished by the secular Turks in 1924, because the caliph is a very potent symbol of the international unity of the Muslims, transcending all national boundaries and every other loyalty. And so uh, the Crusades ended with the fall of the last crusader territory in 1291. And after that, the Ottomans resumed their jihad into Europe and began to conquer uh, portions of Eastern Europe. And finally, of course, conquered Constantinople itself, the capital, as I said, of the Byzantine Empire, the grandest city in the Christian world. And it was uh, 1453 on this day that that happened. Uh, but it's noteworthy that you have 14, you have 700 years between the origins of Islam and the beginning of the Arab conquests and the fall of Constantinople. 700 years in which there is more or less constant pressure on Europe, constant pressure from the jihadis, except for 200 years between 1095, when Pope Urban II called the First Crusade, and 1291, when the last Crusader territory fell to the Muslims. For 200 years, almost 200 years there, there were no Islamic Jihad incursions into Europe. That's the only period in which that's been the case. So it seems to me that far from being ashamed of the Crusaders, we should be thankful to them and grateful to God for the fact of the Crusades because they prevented 200 years of Islamic Jihad incursions into Europe and thus protected the Christian civilization that all Christians, Orthodox, Catholic, Protestants, all of them owe their spiritual heritage to the Christians of Europe. And that is uh, something that would have been overwhelmed. And we have seen what happens to the captive Christian civilizations in the Middle East. And so uh, the same thing would have happened in Europe if it hadn't been for the Crusades pausing the jihad for 200 years and giving Europe a breather. Of course, now Europe is committing suicide with both hands. That's another matter. But certainly it was saved from that at that time. And after the Crusades, as you say, brother, the Ottomans began to move into Europe. And that was the high watermark of Islamic expansion into Europe uh, on September 11, 1683, when they were besieging Vienna in Austria. And, and, and re repeat the date again, September 11. I just want yeah. to show people how there is this idea of continuing what did not finish. Yeah, the siege was broken on the early in the early morning hours of September 12th, 1683. So to go back to September 11th is to say, we're going to pick up where we left off before we were stopped. And the jihad will now resume. And so it seems very clear that Osama bin Laden chose September 11th for his attack in 2001 with a very conscious historical point in view that where the Muslims left off in 1683, they were now picking up. Yep, absolutely. And there is a book, I'm sure you have it in your library. It's called The Strange Death of Europe. And uh, it's just an amazing book, actually. It talks about how Europe today is allowing those who hate Europe, hate the freedom of Europe, hate uh, the people of Europe uh, to have a safe haven, yet the people who are passionate about Europe, the one that uh, uh, have allegiance to Europe, uh, were the one who are being slaughtered, technically speaking. Yes, that's quite right. It's an, it's an extraordinarily strange situation. And uh, the as I said, actually, the Islamic spokesmen play on these kinds of sentiments very cannily by trying to increase the guilt of Europeans in regard to the Crusades in spurious manner. And to also hand in hand with that is the initiative we also mentioned before uh, to create the impression that Muslim Spain and the Ottomans 
we're wonderfully tolerant and pluralistic and multicultural. So that the Westerner is supposed to think that he was the bad guys in history, that the Crusaders were terrible imperialists and oppressors, and they destroyed uh, beautiful Muslim civil, well, they didn't, but the uh, Europeans destroyed beautiful Muslim civilizations, first in Spain, and then later with the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, well, Robert, we have a few minutes left. Uh, a question that came here uh, through the uh, comments section about, what is your view on Christian churches in the West allowing uh, Muslims, for instance, to either rent from them, to pray in there as a mosque, and so on and so forth? In my view, this is yet another form of how uh, Sharia has its superiority, and it basically trumps, uh, you know, basically anything in whatever it exists. But that's me. I want to hear from you. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, brother. This is very foolish of these Christians. I understand what we have to grant. I understand how they feel. They think they're being charitable. They think they are extending the hospitality and the generosity and the love of Christ to the Muslims and that the Muslims may see this and have a change of heart and uh, come to Christ and become Christian. Who knows? I'm sure that many of them have that kind of thing in mind. However, at the same time, it's extraordinarily naive for them to proceed in this way without realizing that they're dealing with people who have been raised in a culture that recognizes only strength and weakness, and that they don't see conciliation, they don't see an open hand, they don't see generosity as something that they ought to reciprocate. They see it as weakness they ought to exploit. And that means that when they invite these people in and let them pray their prayers there, they are encouraging and enabling attitudes that are decidedly uncharitable, that will menace the children and the children's children of the people who are being so generous and kind. And that puts their charity in a whole different light because the charitable, the people who are receiving this charitable these the, the, receiving this charity, who are the recipients of this charitable acts, are going to see the people giving them the charity as weak and step up their activities to conquer and subjugate them. And uh, it, it's become, in the Christian world to a tremendous degree, people assume that to stand up and defend yourself is uncharitable in some way. Uh, but actually, it is the height of a lack of love and a lack of charity to leave your family unprotected or make your family vulnerable to people who uh, are do not have their best interests in mind, to say the least. So this is a, an extremely foolish action, a dangerous action, and one that's going to reverberate with negative consequences for generations. Would you like to also, uh, uh, before I let you go, uh, we have uh, three more minutes uh, with you, brother. Uh, what What is your feeling about how the Pope lately have been, you know, cozying to uh, the Muslim community and making, you know, uh, outrageous comments, really, uh, about Islam as a religion, as if he's given hope to Muslims, technically speaking, that they're on the right path? It's a disease of the left, and the Pope is very much a man of the left. It's a disease of the left to think, that they can say how they want the world to be, and therefore it will be like that. And so I think that he says authentic Islam and the proper understanding of the Quran reject every form of violence, and he thinks that by saying it, that Muslims will fall into line and behave that way. It's uh, extremely naive, but he does seem to be proceeding from the idea that if he reaches out in love and charity to the Muslims in the same way as these people are who are opening their churches to Muslims uh, for their mosques, the, the mosque worship, that they will respond in kind and there will be peace in the world. He shows that he's ignorant of the real teachings of the Quran and the real teachings of Islam, which do not by any means reject every form of violence, but enjoin violence against unbelievers. And uh, in doing that, these bad ideas have consequences, and he also is endangering the people who take him seriously and believe him, and uh, leading them to a position in which they are far more vulnerable than they need to have been, because they are ignorant and complacent about a very real and growing threat. Absolutely. Well, brother, we are so thankful and so honored to have you. 
and uh, I, I wish we can continue on, but I'm, I'm hoping that you will accept our invitation again to come back. And, and really, I, I would love to talk to you about Sharia law in the West, actually. I mean, I have a dear sister, her name is Sister Khadija, who's been telling us some amazing things about how Sharia law in the UK has been trumping the law of the land. I mean, it's just absolutely uh, outrageous to hear things like this. All that yeah. to say is thank you for featuring this book. I encourage everybody to get a copy of it. Uh, it's available in at least a couple of formats. You can buy it as a hard copy. You can download it as a Kindle. I believe version is called The History of Jihad from from Muhammad to ISIS. Where can people find it, uh, Robert, if you want to share uh, a little any, bit about If there are any bookstores left, then it should be there or you can order it. It is at Amazon, at least for now, and barnesandnoble.com. And so you should be able to get it there. Uh, and I am sorry to run out. I'm an old man now and I can't really, uh, I wouldn't be any good uh, after an hour anyway. Uh, stop making sense. But I would, I look forward to, uh, speaking with you further and hope we will do this again soon. Thank you. And I'm going to uh, let you out here, but one last question. If people want to uh, support your efforts, where can they do that? Yeah, uh, you can give to Jihad Watch, which is a 501c3 organization uh, via PayPal to director at jihadwatch.org. Or uh, you can go to the Jihad Watch website and there's a donation button, which will show you how to do that uh, without PayPal, uh, which is, far better, of course, because PayPal is tied into that uh, sinister cabal that uh, controls everything else. But uh, in any case, your donations were gratefully received and much appreciated. Thank you so much. And thank you uh, for being here with us. Everybody else, you can stay if you like. I'm going to stay for a few more minutes, by the way. And we're going to let our uh, brother here uh, off the hook, if you wish. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll be in touch, Robert. Take care. God bless. Well, God bless. Bye bye. Well, everyone, thank you again. Um, and thank you for our moderators. And I hope you've enjoyed this topic. I know it's a tough one. I, I take these topics very seriously. I do not take them lightly. I do not bring people, just any person to talk about topics like this. It's not about emotions. It's about research. It's about facts. It's about where are we getting our information from sources if you wish. Uh, what I like about people like um, uh, Robert Spencer is that he does his research. He gets the information from the primary Islamic sources. What do I mean by primary sources? At the top of that is the Quran that's considered by all Muslims to be the word of Allah. There is the Hadith, which is considered to be the sayings and the teaching of Muhammad. There is also the Sirah, which is known as the biography. The biography, that's with an S. Mine is Sira, C-I. Mine is C as in Charlie, C-I-R-A. But uh, the Sira of Muhammad is with an S, S-I-R-A, the biography of Muhammad. He gets it from the primary sources so that everybody knows that this is how Muhammad lived. This is what he revealed from his God. This is how he practiced and so on and so forth. That applies to a lot of things, not just jihad. But that's why I, I hesitate to bring just anyone. I like to bring people who know their stuff. And the reason why I want to bring them also, uh, I mean, I can talk about these things all day long, but uh, the idea is that you want to bring others who are passionate about the topic uh, so that they can complement uh, the view that we have, where they can show that these uh, information are readily available, readily available for any of you, whether you speak Arabic or not. Robert doesn't is not an Arab, does not speak Arabic. He comes from that background, but technically he is using his own, uh, uh, doing his own homework, doing his own research, which is my also advice to all of you, especially to our Muslim friends who are here, Fatima, you know, uh, Ahmed, who came here just to waste time, uh, and others to please do your own homework. These are your own sources. Are you saying your Quran is lying? Are you saying your prophet is not telling the truth? Then take it up with them. It seems to me that you are not actually um, uh, in, engaged with your own teaching. Uh, you are basically attacking your own sources. And that's something you're going to have to deal with because I don't really think that a whole lot of Muslims going to appreciate Muslims attacking their own Islamic sources also. You have the Salafis who basically are the 7th century Muslims who consider everybody else to be no Muslim at all to be a 
hypocrite Muslim, they call him. That's what the Quran in chapter 9 called. There are three groups that are mentioned in there. You have the believers, reference to Muslims. You have the hypocrites who are fake Muslims. And then you have the people of the book who are being shared. And then it deals also with the infidels at least at the beginning of that chapter. Now, where do you get your information from the Quran about jihad? Chapter 9. Chapter 9 is should be at the top of your list. Why? Because in order for us to understand the chronological revelation of Quran, chapter 9 came towards the end, if not the last one that was revealed by the Prophet of Islam. Therefore, it came last chronologically speaking. Then you have to understand another thing when it comes to the doctrine of jihad. That's the doctrine of abrogation. The doctrine of abrogation, where indeed things that came last will abrogate things that came uh, in the early life and the teaching of the Prophet of Islam, verse 9, uh, verse 5, I should say, in chapter 9, which is known, verse 5 in chapter 9, known as the, chap uh, the, the verse of the sword or the sword verse, according to Islamic sources, single-handedly have canceled anywhere, it depends on the source you look at, 117 to 124 peaceful verses in the Quran, canceled. They're no longer valid. You can quote them if you want, but they don't apply according to the Salafi view, like Ibn Kathir, for instance, and others will make reference to things like this. A simple a search about abrogation and the abrogated, you'll find a list of verses and you'll see that chapter 9, verse 5, basically is among the chief uh, of these passages that were reference it is those kind of passages that people like isis uses like al-qaeda uses like the taliban will uses and others like them in the future by the way don't let the name fool you you can call, they can call themselves isis or al-qaeda or whatever it's the ideology behind the movement it's not the name that drives the agenda and the ideology comes from the primary sources the quran and the hadith and obviously the biography of the prophet of islam here we go. We have our friend Ahmed again, Ahmed Bakr said, and they ask you, Muhammad, about the soul. Uh, say, uh, he's recording, uh, according to the Quran, say the soul is the affair of my Lord. You know, Ahmed, I'm so glad you brought this uh, verse uh, just to show you how ignorant the man you follow is. They ask him about what is the ruh, okay, the soul. And uh, people like you go around preaching that Aruh was Gabriel, Jibril, okay? Wouldn't it have been funny, you know, and easy for Muhammad to say, well, wait a minute, Aruh is the angel Gabriel. No, it took him a while, and you go and read about the uh, reason for the revelation that some will even claim it took him a couple of weeks to come back and say, well, uh, the spirit is a matter for my God to decide. I could have said that in my sleep. I mean, if that's the case. And he considers himself to be the revealer of the Quran. I mean, please don't embarrass yourself by bringing these kind of examples, okay? Now, thank you everyone once again for joining us. I hope that topics like this are appealing to you. And here's why. Next Friday, actually, we're going to start earlier at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. We'll announce it, of course, because the topic is going to be powerful. Two hours talking about the psychology of jihad with a dear friend and a dear brother who was here, by the way, I'm not going to reveal his name, who was with, here making comments also. And we are going to do this uh, feature of a documentary movie done by him, a three-hour movie, and uh, it's called The Art of Imposture, Art of Imposture. And uh, technically, we will be featuring things about jihad and the psychology behind it. And it's going to be really eye-opening, sobering to many of you. And it aches my heart because I ache for the young Muslims in that video, in that movie. We're going to show you clips who sacrificed their life for nothing, for nothing, thinking that they are going to heaven, to paradise that they will not be judged anymore. Their sins will be forgiven. And on top of this, they're given 72 versions. Oh, my dear Lord. We get excited to be with the Lord, absent from the body, present with the Lord, and they want to be present with 72 versions. That's their motivation. Youngsters messing with their genes, messing with their emotions, and they truly believe. They truly believe that that's their final destiny. What an amazing, 
amazing uh, thing indeed and a sad and tragic as well. I do things like this because I love my Muslim people and I want them to wake up from the deep sleep they're in. Wake up from the deep sleep they're in because there is hope and there is way to heaven and Christ shed his blood already for you. You don't have to do it anymore. That's an eye opener for a Richard man like me, when I once wanted to go and fight and die, and the Lord says, I've done it for you. Come to come home, come to the Father, come to the heavenly family. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's the message behind all of our videos and our live streams. It's Christ and Christ alone. And that's what we want you to uh, focus on. This Friday, uh, this Sunday, the day after tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern time, we're going to have Brother Mike uh, Westerfield, who been with me before. He shared his testimony last time here on live stream and before also on our YouTube channel. And we're going to talk about a very interesting topic. It's, it's going to end up evolving basically into a video series. And he agreed to do this with me on an average of twice a month, Lord willing. It's the psychology of Islam, the psychology of Islam. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Monday, Lord willing, we're going to have Sam Shimon, and we're going to have the Shimonian show, as always. Uh, next Wednesday, we're going to have Alex. Next Friday, uh, June 5th, we are going to have the uh, feature, uh, uh, basically, uh, we're going to call it basically Let Us Reason Prime, featuring this movie about the psychology of jihad, the psychology of jihad called Art of Imposture. And next Sunday, the 7th, Sister Khadija will be with us yet again, talking about apostasy, life on the other side, once you leave Islam. All that to say, we are hoping that you find these videos to be helpful. Please share them with others. They are live streamed at both Facebook and, and YouTube. We want many to benefit from those testimonies many of these teachings and so on and so forth uh, believe it or not i am an author i write periodically uh on a website called answer in islam i have a number of uh, basically articles in there one such article is related to today's topic it is called basically the dilemma of jihad doctrine the dilemma of jihad doctrine the myth of quranic warnings versus violence commands the myth of Quranic warnings versus violence commands. Go to answering-islam.org under authors. You'll see Al-Fadi in there and uh, uh, you will be able to read. The argument that I raised technically has to do with the fact that even the so-called peaceful verses in the Quran did have a warning of violence in them. That's all I'm trying to prove. They have warning of violence proven by the fact that right after the revelation, violence started to take uh, a hold of things. If it is a peaceful religion, why would violence happen right after versus, let's say, in the beginning and shift back? Even starting at the beginning is a terrible thing anyway, right? But the idea that these kind of teachings trumped and abrogated and Kunk, uh, and over uh, basically wrote any peaceful passages is the reason why we have movements like the so-called ISIS, Al-Qaeda, uh, uh, the Wahhabi movement, and then so on and so forth. So don't let the idea of reformation movement fool you. Reformation in Islam is going back to basics. The seventh century Islam and jihad is at the center of all of that. Remember to try to get a copy of this book that our guest Robert Spencer wrote The History of Jihad. He has other books that deal with issues like this. Just go to his blog, at least. Uh, he's the director of jihadwatch.org. You'll learn a tremendous, uh, a, big, a great deal and tremendous amount of information about topics like this. Go even to our uh, website that I partner with others and writing uh, on that website called answering-islam.org. Soon we are going to launch our Sira International blog and we will have featured writers uh, write on different topics. Political Islam is one of them. This is along the line of those uh, technically. And pray for uh, also a collaborative effort that I will be doing with our brother Nasser from Saudi. We're going to start doing some discipleship teachings on a live stream. We will be inviting uh, others as well to talk about topics such as political Islam, like Dr. Bill Warner and the likes. Thank you. Love you all. Appreciate all that you do for us, especially for you moderators, for your sacrifices. And until Sunday at 6 p.m., May the Lord bless you. 
my beloved. Take care.